So let's look at the war in phases and begin with the first contact really in 218, 216 BC. Now obviously again I've talked about the epic nature and the fame of Hannibal's march to Italy but again that should remind us one of the reasons why it acquired such mystique was that it was a really major enterprise. It was extraordinarily difficult to get a large army capable of doing what he wanted to do all the way from bases in southern Spain through the rest of Spain, over the Pyrenees, through southern Gaul, over the Alps, into Italy. And you know he's supposed to have left um, New Carthage, modern Cartagena, in the spring of 218 BC with an army of 100,000 and 30 odd elephants. You know, they get all the, the limelight, but um, they don't make that big a contribution to the, the, the campaign, really, even though it's, they're so associated with Hannibal. You've got initial campaigns to cross the River Ebro. Um, some Allied detachments are sent home because they're only really obliged or wanted for that part of the journey. And by the time, um, you know, others order to um, remain in Spain to reinforce the troops that will protect it. That army is reduced to about 80,000. And by the time he's crossed the Pyrenees, it's reduced to about 60,000. There's more fighting in southern Gaul against local tribes who really just don't fancy the idea of a foreign army marching through their territory and wish, wish to assert their own um, status, their own strength, and think that, well, they can prey on the Carthaginians and get some good loot and prestige there. Not the best move, as it turns out, but they weren't to know that. And by the time he's got to the River Rome and across that, he's got about 36,000. Finally, you've got the passage of the Alps, where you've got bad weather, they suffer from that, ambush from some of the locals living there. Again, the ranks are thinned even more. By the time Hannibal arrives down um, in northern Italy, he's got 6,000 cavalry and 20,000 infantry. So 26,000 from 100,000, so a quarter, just over, of what he started out uh, the campaign with just a matter of months before. I mean, this is November. Um, so from whenever in the spring he set out. It's got 37 more elephants, so they've got there. That's all, if not the vast majority of the ones he started out with, um, although one of the, all but one of those will die before the end of the next winter. Sorry, before the end of this, the, the winter of 218 to 217 BC. So, you know, it, it's worth reminding ourselves of these figures, and they're given in... You know, by the standards of ancient sources, moderately reliable sources like Polybius, that's a startlingly high rate of attrition. Um, now, presumably, many of the people who disappear along the way are stragglers, are deserters, rather than necessarily fatalities. Um, but there are some interesting patterns in the way the figures break down. Obviously, some are mentioned early on the contingents that are sent home in the early initial stages of the operations in Spain. The ones that reach Italy are effectively the best troops Hannibal has. And you know, he gets 37 elephants there. Now elephants are pretty delicate things and they will die in the months that follow, but they get to participate in the Battle of Trebia beforehand. So they get to do one thing uh, militarily and may have been an extra edge that helps him win that battle, although they don't figure that prominently in the accounts of it. But he's got Libyans, the best Spanish troops, 20,000 or so infantry, 6,000 with the Numidian cavalry, um, 6,000 mounted troops. Now that proportion, 6,000 cavalry to 20,000 infantry, is a very high proportion of mounted men. And if you think about difficult marches and movements of armies in this period, the first thing you'd expect to break down are the horses rather than the men. You expect there to be a much higher attrition rate amongst animals and particularly cavalry mounts than there would be amongst people. Not least because if you're really you know, in dire straits, then a, a man can eat a horse, a horse can't eat a man. Uh, but also, you know, legs will break more easily. They're keeping them in any sort of condition. And they, it's fairly clear that the horses that do arrive are not in the best shape, but they're good enough to do what is required of them. So Hannibal has got the very best part of his army to Italy, even though he's lost an awful lot of the chaff along the way. Um, and again, it you know, it is still staggering. His, the, the attrition rate is pretty appalling. The casualty rate, even if you know others have just wandered off, um, is very, very high, but he has got there. 
Um, it's well into 217 BC where the sources know that the horses start to get back into some sort of shape through diet and exercise and just recovering from the, the hardships of that, that journey. But they're still able to operate, and in the same way, you know, um, Napoleon's cavalry at Ulau and over the crashes and they couldn't charge much any faster than a trot, but they did the job. Um, and to some extent, having horses that aren't rushing to gallop off can be a military advantage because it helps good quality units to keep together and a charge by a disciplined body keeping together at a you know pretty round trot in Cromwell's words um, is often more effective than a, a much wilder more enthusiastic gallop which can easily turn into a panic route going the other way. So Hannibal reaches Italy in spite of all the obstacles and um, He's got the hard core of his army, the best troops there, but that's 26,000, so that's only a little bit bigger than a standard consular army. If he wants to have a major edge over the Romans, and if the Romans start to mass their armies together, then he needs more soldiers than that. And um, he's expecting from the start to recruit allies from the locals beginning with the Gallic tribes where he's arrived in northern Italy and he knows doesn't like the Romans and who will join him in some numbers and help him win the Battle of Trebia um, in December of 218 and later on other groups within Italy. He will be able, it's quite interesting, he does seem to bolt on these new contingents and you notice that the Gauls who are none too disciplined and given a sort of a simple but brave role at Cannae a few years later, contingents of Gauls are moving fast in a very organised manner as part of the successful capture of Tarentum. So you see these units becoming better, getting more closely integrated into the sort of the command structure and the workings of the Hannibal's army, rather than being simply an allied contingent that boosts your numbers and fights alongside you. Anyway, Hannibal's got to Italy, but that's where his war really begins, because this is only preparation. This is to allow him to threaten the Roman Republic, which is the purpose of going there in the first place. Simply getting to Italy has achieved nothing else beyond putting him onto his, his forming up point, his start line almost. Now, the boldness of this attack has clearly wrong-footed the Romans because this isn't what Carthaginians have done in the past. You know, they haven't been like this. Scipio, the man on his way to Spain, had stopped at Massilia en route and was staggered to learn that Hannibal's army had passed by not long ago going eastwards, going in the opposite direction. There's a skirmish with the rear guard. He sees traces of the, the old camps that the Carthaginians have been in. So, he, you know, it's made very clear, yes, this really big Carthaginian army has gone that away and is now behind us. And um, so that confirms the truth, but he isn't able to engage Hannibal or stop him and fight a campaign around Massilia in, in southern Gaul rather than anywhere else. The consul Scipio then decides that on his own initiative he's going to return to northern Italy and take charge there, but he sends his brother in command of his army onto Spain itself. So he doesn't really have the right to do this. This is, but it's the sort of thing that the, the, you, you can hope to persuade the Senate, well, I was acting for the best interests of the Republic and I'm trying to help. We want the most senior man possible to meet Hannibal when he, if he gets to Italy and take charge of the troops that are currently under command of the Praetor there. Uh, now obviously also there's the element where you could say, well the Praetor's not so senior so you know we need, need the best man, the most senior man on, on the spot. On the other hand it's also in classic Roman aristocratic way, I want to get the glory for doing this. If there's going to be a big war against Hannibal, I want to be the man in charge to fight it. But again, this is on his initiative, but given the distances involved and the time that would take for any exchange of messages, he doesn't, um, isn't able to consult. So it's not practical, it's, it's do it or not. So he either kept on with his forces to Spain. It would probably have been difficult to drag them back. It would certainly have been questionable behavior from the Senate's point of view if he decided, well, I'm not going to Spain at all, I'm going to bring my army back to Italy. But also it would be much harder to sail back in that direction when this move is already underway. The Romans, so he ends up back there, he gets himself wounded in the sort of large-scale cavalry action at the River Ticinus in late November. And um, 
The Senate has now learned that Hannibal is in northern Italy. Longus is recalled from Sicily because they're thinking, well, we've already got one army on its way to Spain. Can't get those back. We've got one army in northern Italy, but Hannibal's arrived there. This is the this is where the raw war really is. It isn't in Africa. It isn't in Spain. The real war, the key place is going to be northern Italy. So Longus, Sempronius Longus and his two legions and allies are recalled from Sicily and brought to northern Italy. So already you've got two consular armies preparing to meet Hannibal, combining forces. So that would push from his army of 26,000. If he hadn't been able to acquire local allies among the Gauls, he would have been facing a Roman army of 40 odd thousand almost at the start, which is a pretty tough proposition, particularly as, yes, he's confident, but he hasn't yet shown his men that we can easily beat a Roman army in a pitched battle. Now, Scipio as consul takes charge, but then gets wounded. So it's Sempronius Longus who is in charge for the late December Battle of the River Trebia. Um, four legions brought together. He's eager to attack the invader and defeat him again. You come into the Roman political system. It's nearly the end of his year of office. So he wants this, you know, normally armies wouldn't be fighting in December, but then normally they wouldn't march all the way from Spain and cross the Alps into Italy. This is unusual from everybody's point of view. It's not easy to operate at this time of the year, but they're desperate to do it. Hannibal needs a victory. He needs to show potential allies, look, I'm here, I'm going to win. Um, and the Romans need to send the opposite message and if possible, defeat him straight away. End this war really quickly, or at least end this serious threat that has come out of nowhere. Sort of thing the Carthaginians have never done before. Suddenly they're attacking us, so let's beat them straight away. Um, this made it much easier. The eagerness on Longus's part made it much easier for Hannibal to lure him onto ground of his own choosing and fight a battle and he shatters the Roman army, although a substantial part with Longus breaks through his centre and escapes. He's got his first really big victory in a pitch battle. Tachinus helped, but it's not on the same scale. And that brings far more allies from the Gallic tribes, but also it means they supply him with food as well as what he can seize. So he's able to support his forces until the spring. <coughs> now, it must have been obvious to the Romans that Hannibal hadn't come to northern Italy just to sort of hunker down there and defend. So this means that he's going to attack again come the spring. The nature of Italy, the basic shape of the land with the Apennines as this spine of mountains running down the centre, means that he's really going to go along one coast or the other, east or west coast. So that's the gamble. How do you meet him? You've got to think of each of those. So the Senate gets two new consuls, two new armies formed, and puts one on either side of the Apennines. So there's somebody to meet Hannibal whichever way he goes. And then the idea is that they're to guard the route, find out where Hannibal is, and then once they know, summon the other consul to join them so that they can meet Hannibal as a combined force, not fight him as individuals where there's a fair chance they're gonna be outnumbered. Fight with our main strength of two armies. Um, however, Hannibal doesn't give them the opportunity. He moves quickly. He ambushes the consul Flaminius at Lake Trasimene. And again, mentioned already that getting his army into position under cover of darkness in these ambush positions along the anticipated Roman route line of march is a, a real sign of the quality of Hannibal's men and their leaders, because this is, you know, this is hard stuff to do. The Romans then, in the aftermath with um, Flaminius killed at um, Lake Trasimene and his army all but wiped out. Some of the, the vanguard breaks through, but a large number of men um, are killed or captured. They rely on an emergency measure. The Romans appoint a dictator, a sole magistrate with supreme power, but only for six months, so half the consular year, but all other magistrates are subordinate to him, or in, you know, in one sense you could even say their imperium always lapses, certainly when he's present. They recruit more legions to provide the dictator with more troops. And this man's Fabius Maximus, the, the, gets the nickname Cunctator, the delayer. And he shadows Hannibal's progress, does his best to harass the foraging parties, will not be drawn into battle. He refuses again and again. Some dispute where one of his subordinates does get involved and get, has a, suffers a minor defeat. Again, this can sometimes be misunderstood. In the later sources, it gets turned into this, well, the secret to beating Hannibal is not to fight him at all. Just let him wear himself out and eventually starve. That doesn't seem to be the intention at the time. The intention is to give the Romans a recovery space, a breathing space, basically. So his idea, his purpose is to watch the enemy, keep an eye on them, but 
help the Romans to recover their strength, build up forces again, at which point a weakened Hannibal might be able to be confronted, but only at a time and place of our choosing. Don't fight on his terms, fight on our terms. But there's tension and, you know, the, the instinct to confront an enemy that's marauding around, burning down your villages, your farms, eating up your crops, is very strong and there is this minor disaster. Um, he gets the shorter-lived nickname, which doesn't survive, Hannibal's Pydagogus, like the, the slave that followed a schoolboy carrying his books and walked with him to school and this sort of thing, because he follows Hannibal around but doesn't actually harm him. By the start of 216, the Romans have rebuilt their strength so that each of the new consuls get um, four reinforced legions to command, so double the normal consular army, um, even slightly more than that. Another two legion army is also sent to Cisalpine Gaul to restore Roman dominance there, because obviously, you know, Hannibal's got new allies there and that's encouraged the tribes that the Romans are now weak. There's been two legions in Spain since 218. Those are now um, confirmed, they're kept in existence. So, but the main effort was always going to be Italy and the main effort is against Hannibal himself. Yes, you're dealing with the tribes in the north, but you really want to smash Hannibal once and for all. You know, Eight legions have never been concentrated into a single field force. The text of Polybius suggests that you'd form two four legion armies to meet the big Gallic threat in 225, but although they ended up coming on either side of the Gallic army, they weren't operating as a single force, and it was largely accident that brought them together at the right time. So the idea was to smash Hannibal. You know, Polybius talks about the Roman instinct to rely on be our brute force, you know, violence. Um, to solve a problem. If, if you hit something with a hammer and that doesn't break it, then you just get a bigger hammer. And the army for Cannae is the biggest hammer they could find. The tactics involved are crude and simple, because that's probably all you could do with an army like that. Many of the troops having only been a matter of weeks under arms, um, and no one having any idea of how to control this many people before. But it doesn't work. And again, because we know that Cannae is this great Roman defeat and this incredible victory for Hannibal, we can take it for granted. It wasn't a foregone conclusion. Hannibal could have lost very easily. And it, it's again a testament to his skill as a commander, but also the skill of the commanders at each level below him and of his troops and how this army had come together that they are able to wrong foot the Romans so completely, use the Roman strength against them and then destroy a larger Roman army. You know, it's very rare for any cavalry in history to win a decisive victory over their counterparts and then rally and charge again. Hannibal's cavalry, um, his left wing, do that twice at Cannae. You know, they not only beat the, the Romans facing them, but then they go around the back, destroy the other wing of Roman cavalry, and then they rally again, and at least some of them go in and attack the Roman infantry from the rear. You know, that gives an idea of just how well disciplined, well controlled, and how practice as a team Hannibal's men are. That's really, I think, the key thing to emphasize. But he does suffer heavy losses, you know, about 10% losses, probably double the normal amount for a victor. And this is in a big army in the first place. And again, this emphasis on lots of your, your leaders and junior leaders going, lots of your boldest, your best men. You could say in some ways the army is probably never quite the same afterwards. And Cannae was, though, an absolutely devastating blow to the Romans, particularly as it's followed on from these earlier disasters. So, you know, you've got 100,000 dead by this point, you've got a third of the Senate dead in a matter of three years, less than three years. And, you know, in later years, it would be a rhetorical sort of commonplace, an exercise for schoolboys to debate whether or not Hannibal after Cannae should have marched straight on Rome and attacked the city itself, or at least threatened the city itself. But that's really, you know, historians have discussed this ad nauseum. It's probably to miss the point. This would have been an even greater gamble than marching to Italy in the first place because basically he's not equipped to besiege the place. He hasn't got the food to do it and stay there. The Romans still have some other troops there and Rome is a very big city. It's going to take time. The gamble is that arriving outside Rome with all the might of your army so soon after such a catastrophic defeat would convince the Senate, look, we've got to throw the towel in, we've got to negotiate and see what deal we can get from the Carthaginians because, you know, how can we face, how can we cope with this? It's a little bit like the situation in the summer of 1940, um, before the Battle of Britain. Um, yes, if you look back 
and you think sort of carefully and logically, you can see that with the Royal Navy, with fighter commanders, it had been built up and it, its system and Britain's industrial capaci capacity compared to a Luftwaffe that's tired after its victories, a uh, Kriegsmarine that simply can't match the Royal Navy, isn't prepared for this, hasn't been planning for this anyway, um, the, the Germans don't have the physical capacity to mount an invasion of Britain, that Operation Sea Lion is just not really feasible, and that therefore, you know, why should Churchill worry? Because basically he, can, he knows he can stick it out, he knows that the Germans can't defeat him militarily. That's very easy with hindsight to say, and there's an awful lot of truth in it, not denying that to any degree, but it's having that willingness to fight on when it looks as if, you know, all your allies have just been swept away, all of them locally. The Germans have been winning everywhere they go, and there's only the English Channel, and, you know, on a clear day from certain spots, you can see across that. And you have to think, well, you know, we haven't got much equipment for our army, if they do get here, how on earth do we stop them? And also, you don't know with the population. You know, it's it's you never know when your people are going to say, right, sorry, look, that's not it. We're not taking these sorts of losses, these sorts of risks. Let's just talk to them. You know, we can sort it out. Um, again, hindsight makes it clear that the challenges faces the Germans were far more obvious than they actually were to to anybody, even people with considerable knowledge in 1940. You know, the situation looked grim, even to those who. If they'd sat down and actually counted resources on either side, would probably have been a, a lot more comforted. Because again, you don't know, and you can, any group can get on a successful role, and it can just get to the point where you just believe they can do anything. And whatever they do, they'll get away with because somehow you'll make the wrong decision, or you'll back down, or you'll crack just before. Um, you know, the Japanese probably shouldn't have been able to take Singapore, but they did. Um, and so again, the, Seeing this entirely in a practical way and saying, well, Hannibal probably couldn't have taken Rome if he'd marched up there and the Romans had decided to fight, isn't really the issue. But I think also marching on Rome isn't really the issue. Um, it's more about, you can see from Hannibal's be actual behaviour that he expected Rome at this point to talk, because that's the reasonable thing. Um, you know, he sends an ambassador to Rome to negotiate, for, or at least first of all to the Roman field commander who then forwards him on to Rome um, because one of the consuls survives, can I? And the normal practice is to negotiate how are you going to ransom all the prisoners that we've taken from, you know, you want them back, this is how much you're going to have to pay, what about ours, you know, we've got more than you've got so let's, you know, let's do a deal, we should be, we can charge you a bit less to get our people back for free or something like this. And those sorts of negotiations, negotiations for exchange of prisoners and hostages have been going on all the way through the First Punic War and all the way through the Second Punic War up until this point. It's, a, it's not talked about too much, but it's just there mentioned in the sources as a routine thing. Hannibal's ambassador will go to Rome, come before the Senate, and the Senate will tell him that unless he's off Roman territory in 24 hours, he's going to lose the protection of being an ambassador and they will kill him. You know, they don't, they refuse, first of all, to talk about prisoners in any, any shape or form, and they forbid individual families from going and um, negotiating on a personal basis to get back family members. You are not allowed to ransom anyone at all. That's the official line, and this will be imposed on individuals as well, but also we are certainly not going to talk about peace. So you have a shock, really, because it's hard to imagine that any other state in the ancient world would have done this in the circumstances. You know, if you think of the battles that the Persians lose against um, Alexander, they don't negotiate, but Darius loses his credibility as king and retreats, and an awful lot of communities do change sides and do switch over. But the Romans won't. The Romans won't talk, and um, the consul who's is blamed in later sources for causing, being a major cause of the defeat at Cannae, but who survives, is given a vote of thanks for not despairing of the Republic. And there are stories of the young Scipio Africanus you know, holding a sword and making some of his fellow tribunes who are about to flee abroad rather than surrender to stay and commit to the Republic and fight for it. So a new dictator's appointed, new legions are raised, some are composed of freed slaves, partially equipped by um, stripping trophies of weapons and armour that had been dedicated in temples from past victories, and the war would continue. At this point, really, you could argue that Hannibal's failed in his objective. He'd gone to Italy 
to dismay the Roman Republic, to do terrible things to them and make them negotiate. He's done the terrible things, they won't negotiate. Now, again, it's hard to see any other state doing this, but it's partly because the Romans have this vast manpower that they are able to think, okay, we've lost 70,000 men, we've lost 100,000 men in the last three years. They get news that the army they've sent off to northern Italy to fight the Gauls has been wiped out, so another 20,000 men have gone in the weeks that follow. But that's still leaving them with over three quarters of their military manpower is still there. And yes, those losses are appalling, but you can replace them and the Romans are determined to do so. There is this strong commitment to the state. Now, obviously, they'd lost uh, battles to Pyrrhus earlier in the third century BC, not on the same scale as the defeats at Hannibal's hands, but nevertheless serious defeats. And again, they wouldn't negotiate. They wouldn't talk. They wouldn't quit. They keep on fighting. So you come up against this Roman stubbornness, and in the end, it's Pyrrhus who gives up and leaves. And Hannibal's faced with a, basically the same choices. He can quit. He can go off thinking, oh, well, I tried that. Didn't work or he can continue to hurt the Romans and then eventually they, he reaches a tipping point where he's done so much to them that even these awkward, bloody-minded Romans who are so stubborn will finally say, okay, yeah, we really do need to talk. And by that time, you can impose even harsher terms on them probably because you've done so much to them. Now, from the start, he treated captives of the allied states rather more generously, rather more kindly than his Roman prisoners. Um, and he now releases quite a few of these of when they're you know, of um, well-connected noble families sitting back to their home communities. And he talks to them and says that he's fighting with the Romans for power and glory, not to destroy Rome, which he probably is. I mean, again, that's, that's what most ancient wars are about. The problem is the Romans are so different in the way they think about everything. Now, his victories have shown that the Romans were weak and they're too weak to prevent him marching up and down anywhere he wants in, in Italy and defeating their armies when they come against him. After Cannae, this policy and the greater blow of Cannae starts to bear fruit. There are defections, um, Capua being one of the big ones, lots of Samnites, lots of groups within southern Italy will change sides and join Hannibal. And these are serious blows to Rome's prestige and practical losses, because obviously they take that manpower that you could call upon before, now goes to the other side. But for the moment, the great majority of, as of allies remain loyal. That's the big thing. And again, there have been theories over the past that Hannibal understood the nature of the Roman Republic that relied on these alliances, and therefore his target was always the alliances, not Rome itself. I Again, that strikes me as far too specific. It's all about being unpleasant to the Romans, beating the Romans over the head until they, they basically yell for him to quit. Um, and that's what he keeps on doing. But there must have been an element of shock when, given what he's just done to them, the Romans are still not willing to talk. So let's look at the war as it widens from 215 through to 201 BC. You know, Hannibal sends his brother Mago back to Carthage with the reports of his success. Um, you know, there's talk, there's this marvellous story of his delegation opening these chests and pouring out the rings taken from dead Roman senators and equestrians in the battles, particularly at Cannae, these great sort of heaps, visible signs of this great victory. Um, and then Mago carries Hannibal's request that says, well, I, I need reinforcements and money to help prosecute the war in Italy. And you get this comment by one of his political rivals and critics saying, well, you know, if he's asking for so much when he's won, what on earth would he ask for if he'd actually lost? There is this problem. How much are you willing to commit to this plan that so far has not fulfilled your, your claims for it or your expectation? The Romans aren't talking. The Carthaginian leadership's unwilling to back Hannibal as fully as the Romans will back their commanders in the field. Um, they're willing to continue the war, but they don't send very much to Hannibal. Again, partly it's this problem. He doesn't yet control a major port in Italy, and Sicily is now being contested, but you don't control it enough that you can use it as a secure base. So they're willing to support the war effort, and at the same time support the war effort in Spain and Sicily. Um, and that, you know, you could also argue that actually Hannibal could be a little bit of a Robert E. Lee. You know, he always wants sees his theatre of operations as the priority, so sucks resources in from everywhere else. Because if I can only win here, then we'll win the war. 
and he might be half right, but it does mean you weaken what's going on elsewhere. Hannibal's not quite allowed to do that. The Carthaginian Senate will send resources elsewhere. They'll prosecute the war in Sicily. They'll prosecute the war in Spain. Um, and also, you gain the ally because of the, 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 the scale of the victory at Cannae. Philip V of Macedonia declares war on the Romans' alliance with Hannibal. Um, and that's partly because he's got nervous about the recent Romans' interventions in Illyria and that area and decided basically this was a good opportunity to strike. You know, the Romans are weak, let's have a go at them now. This will, of course, this is something we've talked about in the, the Conqueror of the Proud lecture series, lead to the, the Second Macedonian War and so on. But that's another threat the Romans now face. They've got a powerful kingdom is also arrayed against them, and it's only the other side of the Adriatic. Now, it isn't just that the Romans simply refused to submit, but they took very concrete measures to direct ever greater manpower and resources to waging war. So they're not quite like the Carthaginians, again, in the First Punic War, that we'll keep on fighting, and we'll keep on fighting as long as you know we can, but we're not going to push things. The Romans are still thinking remarkably aggressively. And apart from recruiting freed slaves, they also draw on criminals, on those normally too poor to serve, lower the minimum and raise the maximum age for service in the legions. You've got 12 legions in service in 216 BC before the disasters in Cannae and northern Italy that you know, take out 10 of them to a great extent, or at least there are remnants of able to form two afterwards. There are between 12 and 14 legions by the middle of 215 BC, so within a year you've not only replaced, you've probably slightly surpassed what you had before, and there are 18 of them by 214 BC. Three years later, the mobilization peaks for the entire war when there are 25 legions in being in a single year in 211. Now, there's a fair chance that many of these units were perhaps even initially raised at the sort of smallest size for a legion of the not much more than 4,000 or so, and that others were probably lower than that because they're, you know, the, the pressures of active service and getting enough recruits and supplies. Um, so, you know, minimum paper strength of 100,000 infantry and 7,500 cavalry, there may well have been fewer people actually in service. Some of these units would have been under strength, but you organize them into legions because that's, that's the way your military system works. It's also got prestige with the title, but it's, it's just a convenience for the command structure. Um, but the number of citizens, men and all men promise citizenship as a reward in the case, you know, when the, the freed slaves in service represents between a quarter and a third of all adult males. So, you know, this is a huge mobilization. This is something you're not going to reach again in organized states until you get the levee en masse of revolutionary France and Napoleonic France and then the knock on effect as conscription spreads to other countries who try to keep up. And many of these soldiers do remain in service for long periods. And the troops sent to Spain and Sicily don't appear to have been discharged while the war has continued. And also true of some of those serving in Italy. And the two legions, you know, again, we've heard about the Cannae veterans, they're still around after the war. So you've mobilised, you've thrown resources at it, and you've got your manpower. And the striking thing is there's no impression of compulsion in this beyond the, the pressure, obviously, you'd have peer pressure from your community. Um, you know, on the whole, Roman citizens are still coming forward. In spite of these appalling losses, they are still willing to serve and want to defend their homeland. Because again, remember, all too often, and I remember briefly advising on a documentary series that sort of, you know, wanted to see the Romans as aggressors all the time. In the Second Punic War, they're not. You know, someone has attacked their homeland. You are defending your own fields, your own farms, your own country. And for most people, that's a very powerful motivation. Now, apart from increasing the size of the army, another great change is in leadership. And all the usual rules for restricting office holding, making sure everybody gets a turn, become ignored in this period. Now, some of this is the natural consequence that when you kill a third of the Senate, there are fewer people of the sort of talent and status around that have a, a claim to share in this sort of thing and can compete. Um, so, you know, the, the pool of men has, has declined. But also, it's a very pragmatic response to a real problem. You know, we can't mess around with this. We need the best possible leaders we can get. Now, Fabius Maximus had been consul twice before the war began, and he's made dictator in 217. Um, and, you know, he's... It's very rare for someone to have, have served as much of that. But he's 
Dictator in 217, he's consul in 215, 214 and for a fifth time in 209 BC. Again, former consul Marcellus, he's elected thrice more during the war and another man also received a third and a fourth consulships. At the same time, there's extensive use made of proconsulship, so extension of command informally even when you're not actually holding a magistracy in that year, an elected post. So that most of these people, most of these key commanders hold command pretty much right the way through. Marcellus is always in command of an army from um, 216 until his death in action in 208 BC. Fabius Maximus is also in command somewhere almost throughout the war from the point from the time he becomes dictator. And others have similar long terms or repeated commands with very short intervals. So there are more permanent legions led by the same experienced commanders year after year rather than new army being formed, new general every year. Scipio brothers, brothers remain in command in Spain um, until 211 when they get killed. Um, the younger Publius Scipio replaces his father in 210, even though he's far too young for political office, but he's given an extraordinary proconsular command and sent off. And this is a reflection of the sort of personal nature of loyalty within the Iberian Peninsula. The tribes and the leaders and the cities seem to understand a family name, like the Barkid family or a like the Scipio family, rather more than the sort of the vaguer idea of Carthage or Rome or anything like that. Um, and, you know, he stays there until he drives the Carthaginians out by 206 BC. Um, you know, this is an improvisation. This is someone who would never normally hold this sort of command in normal times. And whereas men like Fabius and Marcellus are serving into their 50s, into their 60s, you know, these are pretty old men, you're getting this new generation like Scipio that are having accelerated careers and talent is being recognized because they really need it. And But also you're getting far more experience. You're having to spend more time in the army and you are learning your trade of soldiering and command against a very tough, very dangerous opponent. So it's a hard school but the Romans do learn, and it's a, it's a sign of one of the reasons for Rome's success, this ability, this flexibility to adapt and learn. You make mistakes, you make some really big ones, but you don't try and make the same ones several times. You learn from them and do something better next time. Doesn't mean the state is wholly efficient or entirely dedicated to war. You've still got politics, you've still got bickering. You know, there are controversies over several of the elections and appointments that still go on in this. But there aren't any stories of men avoiding military service. Um, several Latin cities tell the Romans, well, I'm sorry, we just don't have enough people to do it, but that seems to be genuine. Some actually turn down the offer of Roman citizenship as a reward and say, no, we'd much prefer to stay as we are of our communities. And, you know, the Latins in the whole do not defect to, the, to Hannibal at all. Now, you do get ideas of scandals. You know, there's always the, the sort of the spiff element, the, the people are out to make a fast buck. And Livy tells us this story of um, companies that contract to supply the armies in Spain and are basically running an insurance scam. They find very old ships, load on them non-existent cargo, but they make lists of all of this. The ships go out, they either sink in a storm or are scuttled, and you go to the Senate and you get basically the insurance money, the pledge the Senate had you know, promised to, to pay you anyway. But that's uncovered and dealt with, and it's not everybody's doing that. That seems to be a fairly isolated incident. You know, on the whole, the Romans stick together remarkably well, in the same way that last fleet in the First Punic War is paid for by you know, public subscription, basically people banding together. And it's not simply true of the leaders, it's true of the ordinary Romans and many allied citizens. And this, again, is exceptional even by the standards of ancient city-states, let alone any state on this size. You know, devotion to the cause doesn't always mean that they're you're competent or you've got common sense and the commanders still bicker, their mistakes are still made. Hannibal does carve up some several Roman armies in the, the later years of the war. There's never, you know, the defeats aren't quite as shocking this time because it's happened before. Um, and substantial resources and willingness to employ them weren't sufficient to meet every need. You know, you, the Scipio brothers in particular, there are several accounts of them complaining to the Senate about lack of support. They're not being sent the men, they're not being sent the supplies and material that they need to keep prosecuting this war. And, you know, you have a similar feeling of things going on elsewhere, that there isn't, there isn't enough to go around. Not all the time, particularly when the Romans are stretched. 
So the Roman war effort has its flaws, it's not perfect, but they shouldn't diminish its major strengths. And one of these factors, one of the, the reasons it is so coherent is the Senate there at the center that decides how many armies we raise, who commands them, where they go. You know, commanders are given considerable independence how they run a campaign, especially the further away from Italy they get. They're given a task by the Senate that's, the Senate chooses where they go, it chooses what troops, what resources they have and will receive. After Cannae, there's no more attempts at the sledgehammer approach to crush Hannibal with overwhelming force. What you have is lots of fairly standard consular size armies, two legions and allies operating, sometimes in mutual support, but otherwise independently around Italy itself. And for specific objectives, two or more of these armies might combine for a while, but then they separate when the task is fulfilled. And at all levels, the Roman army keeps getting more and more efficient. You know, battle with Hannibal in a pitched battle is still avoided except in the most favorable terms, and Hannibal's too shrewd to give you favorable terms. But in the meantime, you weaken the enemy in other ways. In Italy, it's the allies who defect Hannibal that are the prime target for Roman retaliation because obviously it diminishes Hannibal if somebody who's joined him can't be protected. And the Romans are particularly angry at this treachery as they see it, someone who's joined the enemy when they're in a life or death struggle. So the Romans severely punish them and gradually they will reduce the number of allies Hannibal has because he simply can't be everywhere. His army is forced to rush around fighting fires. None of the armies that are formed in Italy independent of his main one from his newfound allies prove up to the task of facing and defeating the Romans in battle. They can't defend themselves. So this is a, it's a gain after Cannae to get all these allies, but it also proves to be a severe vulnerability, a severe weakness. Elsewhere, the Carthaginian effort to re-establish themselves in Sicily had to be prevented. So the Romans send big resources there. The war in Spain continues, but it does seem to be the sort of Cinderella army of the time. It doesn't get the resources that its commanders feel it wants, uh, but the, the Romans are more, more interested in just keeping it going there. Um, similarly, the war against Philip V of Macedonia. They send troops and naval assets to go and fight him. They rely very heavily on local allies, particularly the Aetolian League in Greece, to deal with Philip. Philip doesn't have that big an army that he can mobilize for any long period of time but they managed to contain the war and the Romans keep the war fought in and around Greece and its shores rather than letting it be transferred to Italy. Philip doesn't contribute any major direct assistance, uh, let alone reinforcement to Hannibal. I mean, there's a story of Macedonians at Zama that's generally considered to be a, a much later invention. And even if that happened, this is not a significant thing. It's because it's very late in the day when it no longer really matters much. So the Scipio brothers get defeated in Spain eventually, but even then the decision is made by the Senate, okay, we will rebuild power in Spain. They've been helped by the man on the spot sort of staving off utter disaster there. Um, and they break the rules and give this young kid command and send him off with limited resources, but told to go and do your best and see what you can manage. Um, they somehow scrape up enough to give him something to work with. When you contrast that with the Carthaginian war effort, the there is such a lack of coherence on their part. You know, Hannibal maybe is able to direct his brothers, at least when he can communicate with them, but that's not an easy thing. And they've both gone to Spain, they've massed armies there, um, but he has limited to, um, success in persuading the home government to aid him. And they don't seem to have much control over what he's doing. He, it's pretty much individual leaders and communities fighting the, the war as they see fit. He gets new allies, some mercenaries are hired, elephants are captured and trained, and more Libyans conscripted. Carthaginian war effort doesn't expand on anything like the scale of the Roman war effort. It, it, it does increase, but because you, have, you lack that citizen uh, manpower and because there are severer limits to the number of mercenaries that are ever going to be on the market and available and inclined to join you regardless of, of, of cost um, and you know the amount you're able to pay at any time, but also um, the number of Libyans that you can safely recruit, the number of allies that you can safely recruit. They don't, Hannibal gets one significant convoy while he's in Italy of supplies and reinforcements with a few more elephants. So elephants do figure later in the war in Italy, but again, they don't really achieve a great deal. And that's 
more than just the difficulty of, of reaching him and reinforcing him. Um, you know, both his brothers lead armies into Italy and attempt to reach Hannibal, neither gets there. Um, the, the middle brother, Hasdrubal, is very quickly isolated and surrounded by superior numbers of Roman forces, as again, several of these consular armies from being independent forces come together, surround him. He's defeated the Battle of Metaurus in 207. His severed head is thrown into Hannibal's lines. That's the first real confirmation Hannibal's got that he's so close. Invading Italy by this time is just not the same as it was invading it in 218 BC. Everything has changed. The Romans are far better prepared, far more skillful. And Carthaginian armies have not increased. The, the, Hannibal's army has remained good, but the difference between it and the Romans has got narrower and narrower. And in most cases, other Roman armies are at least as good, if not superior, to the best of the other armies that the Carthaginians have been able to form. Mago gets to northern Italy, doesn't really achieve anything. Um, so there isn't, it's gradually they lose in Italy. And, you know, he does, Hannibal does have successes because Roman aristocrats are still instinctively aggressive and they can be baited into fighting. Um, but the losses aren't as traumatic. He captures cities, but also he loses them as well. It's difficult to hold on to them. You know, Tarentum is betrayed to him and he captures it in 212 in a very slick operation. However, it's betrayed to the Romans in 209 and they get it back. So that brief period when he's had a good port, that goes. And Hannibal and the pick of his army can only be in one place at a time, so that he's vulnerable. And again, it goes back to this, he cannot protect all of these allies. And he, the difference, the advantages, all the, the big advantages he had at the start are getting smaller and smaller. They're there, but they're not as marked as they were later on. And he has a big problem that, again, he can't afford to lose a major battle, because if he does, that's probably it. Now, in 212 BC, the Romans send six legions. They concentrate to blockade Capuas. Again, three of these armies are put together. Hannibal wants to help his most important of his, his newfound allies, but he can't maneuver the Romans into a point where they're willing to risk a battle that he is willing to fight. He can't make them give up the siege, and having failed to do that, he makes his first and only effort. He marches up to Rome, demonstrates outside the city. But again, this is a Rome that's less frightened than it might have been in 216. Um, Hannibal is no more capable of besieging the city and again besieging a city when enemy field armies are around and operating in the open even if they're smaller than you is a difficult thing you know even you know, look, look at Caesar at, at Elysia um, and that's a far less formidable position than a city as well fortified and as large as Rome so perhaps it would have been different in 216, though I rather doubt it the Romans are supposed to you know auction off the land on which Hannibal's camp he, he replies by auctioning off property within the centre of the city and the major banks and businesses and all this sort of thing. But again, it, it's all a show. It doesn't achieve anything. He eventually has to, to march off. And in 211, Capua falls. His freedom of movement is more and more constrained. He's sort of closed into an ever narrower area of the, the foot of Italy. Um, Hasdrubal, his brother, as I say, is defeated in Metaurus in 207. So a major reinforcement, a chance to maybe get some momentum going again, turn back onto the, the offensive, is lost. And again, it's a reflection of just how hard these things have, have become. And it is, you know, again, Hannibal wins his Trebia, Trasimene, Cannae. He starts to break away Rome's allies, and the Romans still don't quit and still don't negotiate. As the years go on, you have to think, well, what could he possibly have done? On the other hand, if he gives in, then that's to admit that, okay, our only, our only plan for winning this war has failed. So we're back to First Punic War. Let's just keep fighting and hope that maybe the Romans give in at the very end. And the Romans will win this war in the other theatres. You know, Hannibal is restricted more and more in Italy, but he's never actually defeated there. Macedonia is always a sideshow. The Romans are heavily dependent on the Greek allies. They don't commit many troops. Once the Greek allies quit fighting, then they're forced to as well. They make peace with Philip. But the point is, Philip has been marginalized. He hasn't been able to shift the balance in favor of Hannibal and Carthage in the main war. In And it's no coincidence, as we've seen in The Conquered and the Proud, this is, you know, it, it's, it leaves a, a sort of an angry itch in the Romans' mind, and as soon as they do defeat Hannibal, the Second Punic War is over, pretty much the first thing they do is go and declare war on Hannibal, and the Second Macedonian War is fought again. 
quite a lot about that in the, I think it's the second lecture or the third lecture of The Conquered and the Proud. In Sicily, the Romans, it's a, it's a grueling, hard fight, um, particularly, you know, again, the siege of Syracuse takes a long time, it's difficult, but they win. They persist in that very Roman way, and eventually they, the Punic armies um, is sent to the island, but it, it's not able to defeat the Romans any more than they had been in the First War. And, you know, by about 210, it's all over. Sicily is Roman again. And one of the essential truths of the war is that unless Hannibal is on the spot, the Carthaginians aren't able to defeat Roman armies with any sort of confidence. You know, there, there are some successes in Spain, but that's it. Overwhelmingly, even, you know, they, they just don't win. They can't find the trick, the knack, of defeating even moderately well handled Roman Roman armies. So again, it's it's this odd contrast. Hannibal's army is superb. The other Carthaginian armies perform far, far um, worse. They, they simply don't have those skills that were displayed time and time again with Hannibal. And you know, it's it's again, it's more of a diplomatic success. The Carthaginians managed to break away the Scipio's main act. Iberian allies and that leaves them vulnerable and they're overwhelmed by numbers as much as anything else. And you know for a lot of communities that are caught up in this big war between Rome and Carthage they don't really have any commitment to the fight other than it's a question of what's best for us, how will we survive this? Yes it would be nice to profit from this but in particular you know we don't want to be on the, 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 the bad end of one of these major empires anger. So it's very difficult and different communities negotiate their way through and they will change sides. It's, it's not surprising, really. So the younger Scipio renews the war in Spain with considerable vigor. And also there's always the danger, you know, when the allies could play the, um, or sorry, when the allied communities could play Rome and Carthage off against each other, there's a lot for them in it. Once the Carthaginians are dominant as they are after the death of the Scipio brothers, then maybe, they start thinking, actually, you know, I don't really like the Carthaginians too much. They demand far more than I really want. I prefer to be fully independent. New Carthage is taken by a surprise assault in 210 BC. It is one of those remarkable coups. It's very well planned. It's very risky, but it all goes just right for the Romans. It deprives the enemy of one of their most important bases. And Scipio the Younger is unable to prevent Hasdrubal Barca from leaving for Italy. But again, his departure weakens the Carthaginian war effort in Spain. So there's an element by calling his brothers and their troops to Italy. Hannibal's thinking, well, maybe I can reinvigorate the war here, but it does mean the Carthaginians are weaker elsewhere. But then that comes back to the problem. If you're just fighting not to lose against the Romans, it's probably not going to work in the longer run because they just don't quit. 207, Scipio comprehensively outwitted and destroyed the last remaining Carthaginian army in Spain. There's some trouble, there's some fighting with some of the Iberian tribes afterwards, but Scipio overcomes that. So the Carthaginians have been expelled from Sicily and now Spain. They're lost, there's no attempt by the Carthaginians to recover either of them. Hannibal's still in Italy, but his number of allies is shrinking, the area where he can go is shrinking. Brother Mago gets there by sea in 205 BC, doesn't make any difference, never joins up with Hannibal himself. He's only in the north trying to get the Ligurians and Gauls to fight more aggressively against the Romans, but they're really busy doing their own thing. They don't want foreign interference. In that year, 205, the Romans elect Scipio, the, this young Scipio, he's still well below the age of 42, where he's supposed to be stand for the consulship, is elected consul. He is given command of um, an army that's sent to Sicily to invade Africa. So they're reverting to the plan right back from the first year of the war. Form an army in Sicily, sail across to Africa, threaten the Carthaginians on their home territory. There are some claims in the sources that there's some opposition to this, that people are saying this is too risky, you know, think what happened in the first Punic War with Regulus, we might, well, just when things are going well, it might make it worse, um, but they're quickly overcome. And this is what happens. He takes Again, it seems to be a, <clears throat> a standard army, and he um, it includes legions formed from the survivors of Cannae, but it's probably it, it's a, a sort of reinforced consular army, basically a bigger one. Gets the resources of ships, he gets the resources of men. He's already had diplomatic contact with a Numidian prince and persuades him to defect. So a lot of these superb light cavalry from the um, Numidian kingdoms and tribes to the, the west of Carthage. These 
significant numbers of these come over and join the Romans, which is a huge boost to their fighting capacity. It makes the army more balanced, takes away one of the big advantages that Hannibal had exploited. You know, Polybius commented after the Battle of Cannae that it shows that if you can outnumber the enemy almost double in cavalry, then it doesn't matter if you're outnumbered in infantry, because if you use your cavalry well, that will be decisive. Hannibal had used them well. Other Carthaginian commanders didn't have quite so many, didn't use them so well. Now the Romans, who've learned from watching Hannibal and what he does, are starting to acquire these excellent horsemen for their own, um, to support their own army. In the invasion, um, it goes very well. And again, it's a sign of just how competent the Romans have become by this time. There's a Carthaginian army that is so tactically outclassed that it's easily routed in battle, comparatively. And then a second army is actually surprised in its night camps and destroyed in a, a sudden attack under cover of darkness. It's basically Scipio doing to Carthaginian armies what Hannibal, well, at least the same sort of thing Hannibal had done to Roman armies in those early years of the war completely outwitting them, outmaneuvering them, outthinking them at every stage. They are outclassed and they don't really have that much of a chance. Briefly, the Carthaginians are willing to start negotiating for peace treaty. You know, they've just lost these two armies. Then they think, no, we better not do that. Let's just bring Hannibal back from Italy. He'll be able to save us. You then end up with Hannibal is brought back, Mago's army is brought back, Mago is dead by this time, and you have the remnants of the troops that were raised in um, to defend Carthage itself. So Hannibal at Zama in 202 has an army that's composed of three distinct elements, and they seem to form the three distinct lines that his, his army deploys in the day of battle itself. He's got more men under his command than he's had for a long, long time, but only about a third of them at best are his veterans who actually know him that he can trust and that still has still this sort of well-practiced team that has come all the way from Spain and had served under his father before that, fought all the way through the war. He's still got the nucleus of that, but it's only a part of his army. And the rest are just not, there isn't time to integrate them in any way. They're not as well motivated. They don't know Hannibal. They're nowhere near as confident. And although he's got more elephants than he's ever had before, most of them are not very well trained. They've been recently captured. The Romans now have all these Numidian cavalry, so they have an advantage in cavalry instead of Hannibal having that. And in the ensuing battle, he's defeated in a major action for the first and only time in his career with the loss of much of his army. Again, it's a sign you see in this battle just how good the Romans have become, particularly under a commander of great talent like Scipio Africanus, and how the Carthaginian strength has been watered down. By this point, the, the, the bit of the army that's still really good is too small to make a difference by this time. And the other sections are you know, mediocre at best. They're certainly not up to meeting the Romans toe to toe and defeating them. So the war is over. The Carthaginians negotiate and they accept a peace treaty that, again, we've, we've talked about earlier on, that makes it abundantly clear that the Romans have won. So let's think of what, you know, are there any lessons from all this from a strategic point of view? Basic question, I suppose, is this. Could Hannibal and more specifically, Han um, sorry, could Carthage and more specifically Hannibal in the Second Punic War actually have won? You know, he led and by every indication masterminded the only major Carthaginian offensive in the entire war. Other than Hannibal's march to Italy, yes, they try and reinforce it. But they never open war on a new front in the same sort of dramatic way. And Hasdrubal Barker and then Mago going to Italy are, are not new ways of doing this. It's basically, let's get more troops to reinforce Hannibal. And they're not able to do that. And he's the man who inflicts all these serious defeats on the Romans, able to march around Italy almost with impunity. And apart from his decision not to march to Rome after Cannae, which, you know, was a gamble, it's, it's really hard to see what more he could have done with the resources he had available to do unpleasant things to the Romans. You know, Carthage could have given him greater support, um, whether directly by making more effort to reinforce him in Italy or committing more resources, encouraging more aggression in other theatres. Um, but their military system doesn't really allow that. They don't have the capacity to keep on raising new armies, particularly new good armies, and finding new good commanders. And then when they raise all these different contingents, turning those into effective field armies is a slow, difficult, uncertain process. Um, 
there's also you know that basic problem that apart from Hannibal's force, Carthaginian armies prove inferior to their Roman opponents just about everywhere on almost every occasion. And that only becomes more true as the, the average standard, the quality of the Romans improves as the war goes on. So your sort of window of opportunity at the start doesn't last that long. So more armies might not have meant more success for the Carthaginians, although they would have made the Romans have to fight harder and lengthen the war. But at the heart of it, again, you're coming back to, well, Hannibal could have done more nasty things to the Romans, but what was the tipping point? What did you have to do to the Roman Republic to make it throw in the towel and say, yes, we're willing to negotiate? We can't actually know that because no ancient enemy does that to the Romans. It never happens. Um, doesn't mean that it couldn't have happened. It just means that we don't know what would have, what would have tipped the, the balance, what would have made that difference. And in the end, it comes back to this cultural assumption of each side as to how they fought. Hannibal fought for power and glory, as he said. And he and his countrymen, you know, just like everybody else pretty much in the Hellenic world, probably most of the wider ancient world, expects you to be able to win some victories, do unpleasant things to the enemy, and then the enemy will see sense and talk. Say, right, Gov, it's a fair cop. What do you want? And you've demonstrated your superior strength. You've asserted your prestige it's all over with, you'll gain some advantages, but you won't destroy the enemy. And by those standards, Hannibal wins this war. The problem is that the Romans don't play by the rules. And then, you know, again, you have to think, well, what else could he have done? And there, there does, you know, Hannibal doesn't come up with any bigger idea after the invasion of Italy and after it, you know, it gets as far as can I. Yes, you try and do more nasty things to the Romans, but there's, there's, no, there's no sort of backup plan. There's no alternative to it. And it's hard to see what that alternative could have been. The Romans just stubbornly refuse to admit defeat. And because they've got these immense resources and because they're willing to spend them, then you know, they are extremely difficult to defeat. Roman citizens keep on coming forward to fight in their armies, and there are simply more of them. And they're at least as determined as those of other states, but they, you know, they keep on coming forward as soldiers, they keep on fighting, they keep on being willing to take the risks and endure military discipline and the severe um, risks of campaigning against a dangerous enemy. So there's obviously a very strong identification with the state and the republic, you know, the sense you are part of this commonwealth almost. Um, that's true in lots of ancient states, but it just seems particularly pronounced in the Roman Republic. Now, again, you've had, we've mentioned it earlier, this idea that Hannibal was really going there to break away Rome's allies, to weaken them that way. No ancient source actually claims that was his deliberate purpose and main aim, rather than a means of achieving the objective of winning the war. Um, but again, it's, it's, you know, it's not really that likely. You strip, stripping a state of allies is a, a fairly standard way of doing unpleasant things to a state to win a war. It's, it's what warfare is about in this era. And there's no indication that Hannibal understood in great depth that the Roman Republic was very different and that saw this as its, its key weakness. Now, again, for all his success after Cannae, the bulk of Rome's allies remain loyal. And that might be through sincere attachment. It might be fear of reprisals. It might also be because Hannibal wasn't making them a good enough offer. Again, when you talk about breaking the allies away, you can understand it for those who wanted independence from Rome. But... Hannibal's not really offering them anything. You know, do you want to be an ally of Carthage? What's that going to mean? What are they going to expect in return for that? Um, Carthage doesn't have the best of reputations any more than Rome has a great reputation for being um, loyal and protecting its allies. You know, and if Hannibal win, persuades the Romans to negotiate and then the Romans accept peace and then Hannibal goes away, if you're one of these Italian states that stabbed the Romans in the back, just what do you think the Romans are going to do to you in future years? So he's not offering them very much that's very appealing. Uh, so any hope that the Romans are likely to be deserted by their allies is, is wildly optimistic. And, you know, Rome is, when all said and done, culturally, linguistically and physically closer to these allies than Carthage was ever going to be. Hannibal doesn't have much to offer them. <laughs> The, the bigger states might, like Capio, can be offered prestige and land, but he can't reward everybody in that way because it's sort of come from somebody else. And, you know, it doesn't work for Capio. It doesn't turn out well for them. So it's difficult to see what more he could have done to convince more Roman allies to switch sides. 
Now, while the physical resources the Romans possess are clearly important in allowing this resilience, Polybius is surely right to see this political system as key to it. I mean, it sounds a very sort of old-fashioned way of looking at things, but it does matter. Unlike any other city-state, there is no faction that appears within the Roman Republic that wants to negotiate, or even more, wants to actually seek an alliance with Hannibal that will advantage these individuals personally, will betray the state, or will side with you, will have a revolution, and will now become the leaders of Rome backed by you. Now, you'd expect that in any Greek state, in you know, any, any period of conflict, really. Um, in the same way that, you know, when the Persians arrive in um, Greece in 490 and then, and then later on, you know, they've got one of the Pisistratids, they've got a, um, an exiled Athenian tyrant, they'll have later a Spartan exiled king in the entourage of the Persian army that's arriving. There's no exiled Roman, because the Romans don't do that sort of thing. Roman aristocrats compete for power, prestige, dominance in Rome itself. If you can't win the game in Rome, the game's not worth playing. They do have this strong sense of identity with the city. So it does mean that although the personal rivalries continue, it's never about, mm, yeah, actually, this Hannibal guy could be useful to me. Let's, let's make friends with him and then I'll be top dog in Rome. Just doesn't happen. And the Romans do seem to identify with their state extremely strongly, which means that Rome has to survive the war. Rome has to be still there to make it worthwhile being a Roman competing at Rome. And it can't be a humiliated Rome, because again, it wouldn't be Rome. So it makes everything almost like a life or death struggle. The Romans can imagine a world where they defeat the enemy and the enemy submits to them. I guess deep in their hearts, they can imagine a world where Rome is destroyed. They struggle to imagine a world where Rome is humiliated and submits and um, accepts a subordinate status to an enemy like Carthage. And Hannibal doesn't have the power to force them. So the Romans survive and they keep on fighting. And it comes back to this basic problem, just how do you defeat a state like that where it won't give in? They're willing to fight to the death or at least to a far more bitter end than any other state. Carthage is not. To that degree, there's an inevitability about the Punic Wars from, from the very start. The Carthaginians will more readily give in. They will not commit quite the same scale of resources to the fight. And in the end, they're going to look at it and think, well, this isn't worth it anymore. Let's just make a deal and be willing to ex and expect a deal that is, as they consider, a reasonable one, a fair one. The Romans are not willing to consider a deal. So they, the Punic Wars offer us a reminder that it's, it's easy to think of wars purely in terms of strategy and how you're going to achieve your objective. But... Each side has its own way of thinking about things. And sometimes you may have these cultural clashes where they think about war in such a profoundly different way that all the common sense, all the reason, all the logic that for one side would mean this is the, these are the steps we have to take. If we follow this path, we will be victorious, don't necessarily work because the others are defining victory and defeat in a completely different way. It also reminds us that allies often have their own agendas. So again, you know, fortunes will sway in the Iberian Peninsula where the locals decide, well, I'm going to back this side now rather than the other. They're not committed. Same in Greece, uh, same in Sicily. And the same in Italy with Hannibal as well. He manages to convince some allies to change sides, but not lots of others. You also have, I suppose, the last lesson of the Punic Wars is comes in the the last one, the, the third Punic War that only lasts three years and seems so one-sided. Because again, it's a reminder, and this is something we've talked about in The Conquered and the Proud, the Romans learn very hard lessons in the First and the Second Punic War in particular, and they improve. Their armies get better and better, their fleets get better and better, particularly in the First Punic War. The standard of generalship improves. The Roman military effort by the latter stage of the Second Punic War is well honed on a very large scale, routinely putting more people in the field than you had in the first year of the war, and you have legions that are more efficient and better led at all levels. And that will last for decades into the second century BC, and it's, it's you know, one of the reasons why they defeat with comparative ease the Macedonians, the Seleucids and others, and they are so successful for that period. However, that experience, that knowledge is forgotten, and many of the lessons that were learned the hard way are by the time of the middle of the 2nd century BC and the Third, Mas the Third Punic War, 
they're forgotten. Roman armies prove themselves to be inept, poorly led, uh, casual when it comes to organising logistics. They, the generals don't know what they're doing. Um, they expect to win because they're Roman and they take a lot of bloody noses and some real hits early on and things go badly. And in other conflicts in the Iberian Peninsula and elsewhere, things go very badly wrong because you've forgotten all the skills that made you so successful, allowed you to endure. It wasn't just the, the stubbornness that allowed you to endure and defeat Hannibal. It was the willingness to learn, to, to copy, to experiment, to innovate, and to improve, to fight better, to fight smarter, basically, as the war went on, as well as fight bigger. Um, that then goes, you forget all of that, and you simply take it for granted, well, we won because we were Roman. And that's the danger for any state that's been successful, any military that's been successful. The longer a peace goes on, the more you simply forget why and how you did it before. So it's, it's rather like, you know, Ardant de Pique, the, the French military theorist, with his comment that nothing is forgotten so quickly as experience. This is well illustrated by the Roman um, experience after the Second Punic War that they learned a lot, they discovered a lot, they persisted and they won, and then they forgot a lot um, over within the course of a generation or so. And it, again, these things had to be relearned the hard way in the future, but fortunately never against an opponent quite as dangerous as Hannibal. So that's the Punic Wars and some thoughts on the strategy of the Second Punic War in particular. I hope it was of interest. Right, bye.